Great. So, thank you very much, everyone. I, it's nothing better than watching a load of people, a load of adults on a sugar high after all that uh, chocolate mousse. Um, look, second part of the, the, the session here, really picking up on the conversation that we had around uh, science and truth and, and some of the data that I was able to share with you. Uh, interesting having some conversa side conversations with people around it already. A bunch of questions that I need to put into next year's survey, uh, for sure. Um, before I kick off, just wanted to let you know, obviously, there was uh, Jenny from KFC who was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, due to a family bereavement, she was unable to make it. So uh, we do have uh, some great panelists here uh, to cover the wider part of the discussion here. Um, so I'm going to start off by asking them to introduce themselves. I'll kind of then talk a little bit more about the data and get their reaction to some of the, the ideas that were emerging there. Kick off. Anna? Yep. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good dinner. Um, <laughs> So I'm Anant uh, from Fat Matter. I'm Chief Revenue Officer. Um, Fat Matter is an AI startup looking at uh, fake news and generally what we call misinformation online. Um, so that can include things like um, hyperpartisanship, which is extreme political bias, and also hate speech online. That can be sexism, racism, religious hatred. Um, and we're using uh, machine learning to detect um, those instances online and we help protect brands from appearing against that sort of content and um, we're also developing another product uh, that I'll tell you a little bit later about as well. Uh, good evening everyone, my name is Graham Forsyth, I'm the Director of Marketing in Europe for a company called Spreadfast. Is, is everyone really on a, a sugar high? I'm very tired. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I had fruit, so I'm yeah, not, you, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not just me. Um, Spread Faster, uh, uh, an Austin, Texas based organization, we, we provide a, uh, a piece of technology for, for marketeers to, to manage their, their social media marketing. Uh, so we tend to work with enterprise organizations who are, are pretty sophisticated in their use of social media uh, to engage with their audience and really are our, uh, the way we work with our organization is to really connect them to their, their audiences or their fans or their, their potential customers of the future uh, through social media. So uh, great topic tonight and thank you for the, thank you for the invite. Great, thanks. So look, as I say, from, from my perspective, having spoke to you both of them earlier on, uh, you know, that they're from the tech space means I'm somewhat in my comfort zone. Um, KFC I might have had a bit more of a challenge with, but uh, uh, look, you know, the, the, the subject matter for the, talk, for, the, for the session started off with this uh, truth is a, a, sorry, silence is a tax on truth. Um, get, interesting to get your view on what it means. So obviously, we've got our, our own perspective. A lot of people, Edelman, wondering what it was when it was posted up on our screen. Um, we have to go and figure it out for ourselves. Um, but yeah, from, from your perspective, Anna, what does, it, what does it mean to what you do day to day and what you're seeing from your clients as well? Yeah, so I think some of those stats that you presented are super interesting. Yeah. Um, We've been also um, working with Isbar and we've uh, presented to them some of your stats, which oh. is quite cool. Um, so especially the ones on how uh, trust has been eroded on uh, different forms of media, um, especially uh, over uh, this year and last year. Um, and you know, seeing that still traditional media is, is high um, compared to the rest, but uh, social media, online media is also... Uh, so, so, social media is definitely taking a bit of a hammering um, and I think that's also in connection to uh, the elections both here in the UK but also in the US that has had an impact on that and then you're seeing uh, some of the other stats today was just like how different countries have uh, been uh, taken uh, in terms of the trust levels like Malaysia was quite neutral there but they've also um, last year created a um, act around anti-fake yeah. news. Um, and now a new government has just been brought in and they're looking to uh, reverse that, actually, yeah. which is quite surprising. Um, so it's interesting to see how the, the different countries are also taking uh, different view, viewpoints on it and being proactive or, and then not so proactive, I guess, as well. And how, just that, just how, how are you helping you know, the clients that you work with address some of these challenges? Yeah. So effectively, where... Um, the first area, if you like, that we're looking at is really around the media, media ecosystem, um, especially brands who are buying media programmatically, um, which is kind of very easy for us to basically ha have as the first stop because effectively when you're buying programmatic, you can basically have a list of all these domains 
um, URLs that are just unknown. Um, so ba basically the brands want to know what they're appearing against, um, especially when they are concerned around things like uh, um, these brand safety scandals that are coming up um, with their ads appearing in the wrong places. Could be things like you know terrorism related, child safety, that sort of content. And what we're doing is really looking at the more difficult areas, uh, a lot of the gray areas to, to tackle. Um, uh, things around um, political bias, for example, and uh, hate speech. Um, so we're protecting the brands from basically appearing on, on that sort of content um, when they're running their ads programmatically. Um, but in the future, we actually see the technology being used for different cases. It could be used by governments, um, uh, like your uh, slide on using fake news as a weapon, for example. So we've been speaking to the UK government already about that. Um, we are also very interested in areas like finance and finance news. Um, so, for example, if a hedge fund is looking at um, financial news and, and updates on Twitter, can they trust that sort of level of data? Um, so, there's lots of other areas that we can go into other than the media side, but the media one is the more obvious one for us right now. Right. Graham, picking up on that, social media um, obviously spread for, I say obviously, and I'll be obvious to everyone else, having worked with Spreadfast in the, in the past, I kind of get a, get a sense of what you do. Can you tell us about how your clients are potentially asking you to, to overcome and address some of these challenges in social media? Yeah, I think, I mean, to, 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 just to clarify, when you said we're all technology people, I'm so, so not technology. No, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some. Hands up if we're marketeers in this room. Good. If you, I only want questions from you guys. <laughs> um, I come at this very much from a marketeer's perspective and from a, a brand opportunity perspective. You know, when I saw the question, I, I, I thought the question was great. Um, and I do think the opportunity on social for us to regain trust is, is, is huge. Um, and I think uh, you know, it's, it's down to us as, as marketeers and down to us as brands and organizations to... Um, actually elevate ourselves and actually create, start creating more connections on social. You know, there's a clue in the title. You know, social media is meant to be social. And we are so kind of caught up in projecting our own um, brand stories and the things that we have to tell as a business that we're not actually having conversations with people. Um, so I think it's, you know, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity for us as, as organizations and as businesses and as individuals to, to take a, a greater control over, over what's happening. Um, you know, we work with... Like I said earlier, our kind of mission at Spreadfast is to really connect people to their audience. And if you're an organization that's just going to keep pushing out your own messaging and you're not actually going to engage in a conversation on social, then that is just not going to happen. You know, but social is a great place to find new audiences and uncover and understand what people are talking about and apply those conversations to your strategy. Um, we were talking just yesterday about some of the work that Spreadfast has done before, and we use a lot of um, social data to kind of report back and see what, see what trends and people are talking about. And we were talking Brexit when we were earlier today, and uh, we were, we were let's say, lucky enough. We, were, we, were we could uncover, due to social data, that we predicted a few days beforehand that Brexit would happen. When everything else was saying it wasn't going to happen, and opinion polls were saying no, we looked at the social data, and you know, the people's opinions and the voices that they were projecting on social were saying, yeah is going to happen, and it did, and we were right. We weren't necessarily happy about being right, <laughs> and, then, and then Trump happened, and the complete opposite, you know, social did not predict that happening, but I don't think anyone predicted that. No. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few commentators now that were predicting that, but it's, but it's interesting, kind of, to your point, getting closer to the audience. Um, what do you think is preventing, you know, and we're in that set as well, uh, marketeers, communicators, from, from achieving that, given that there's so much so much opportunity to do so. I, I mean, I think we have to be realistic in that. As organisations, we've got we've got targets, we've got KPIs, we've got metrics that, that we're all we all have to hit, and and certain things we need to do in our day job. But um, I think we have to get get beyond that. You know, we uh, I, I look at the organisations who I think are, are doing good stuff when it comes to you know really engaging with audiences and and kind of getting closer to their audiences are those who are able to project their brand values out through social. Um, and I think, you know, brand values suddenly become a big piece of the organization. It should be, you know, we should all believe in those brand values that we have. Social is a, a often, you know, a department that's tucked away in the marketing team. They're, they're down in the corner somewhere. Um, no one really knows what they're doing. <laughs> no one's quite sure what they're, they're posting. Um, and social needs to become, right, 
front and center of the business. Um, and I think as, you know, as social marketers and as digital marketers, we need to start questioning the content we're pushing out. How does that reflect our brand values? Um, I use Patagonia as a, as a great example. It's not a, it's not a unique example. I think it's a really good one. You know, they are, they are to US. Um, you go on their website and their brand values are right there in front of you. you know, and the first one is we want to create great products. Great, they've got that little pitch out of the way. So we know they do great products. The rest of it is about what they're going to do for society and what they want to achieve as a business. And their marketing afterwards is consistent. You know, they are following that cause. They are uh, consistently delivering those messages. They, it's not a fad. It's not a trend. You don't look at them and go, it's not authentic, because they are consistently trying to do good stuff. Um, I think a lot of the time as brands, we kind of stick our hands up and try and do social good. And then we disappear again and do our day jobs. And we need to be consistent. And I think you know, a lot of that is internally as organizations going, what do we want to do? You know, what are our brand values? I think a lot of the time of brand values historically were inwardly looking. What are we trying to achieve as a business? What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Well, actually, what are we going to give back? You know, and social is a great platform to do that. And there's plenty of stats out there that now demonstrate that as consumers, we want to buy from brands who we have an empathy with, you know, that actually hold values consistent to us. You know, whether, you, whether you believe that or not, um, I think that's, that's certainly the way things are going because we have so much choice as consumers. Um, I don't know what your Instagram feed like, but mine's trying to force me to buy stuff all the time, and I'm constantly like, that looks good. Yeah. Because they're using that channel for, for great stuff. So I think, uh, I think as businesses, we need to look at how we project ourselves, and social is just an, an element of that. I've certainly seen from my side various clients I'm speak, we work with. You know, there are, we have a discussion earlier on, there are very traditional set, been, in, been around for 50 years, you know, married to 50 years of content and, and, the, and that behavior, and the, the environment's changing, changing around them. You know, some are struggling to that. Others are actually looking at social as a way of iterating much more quickly, rather than that kind of three to six month campaign that you've planned, put all your investment into, all your hope and your dreams into, and then it launches and someone else has done exactly the same thing six months later. I think what we're seeing increasingly is like, how do we start to have that conversation earlier on, try things in social? Um, what, are there any, any lessons to be learned from kind of trying and failing in social as well from, from what your experience? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things is to, to not necessarily try and lead that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, nine times out of ten, that conversation is being happening. So why, don't, why is you as a brand? Why don't you join it? You know, you don't have to be the voice of a certain cause or a certain, a certain communication. You, that, go and find that conversation. It isn't difficult. You know, there are, there are tons of conversations happening. So find these pockets of groups. I think... Um, you know, as marketeers, we're used to kind of big numbers and we want to hit big numbers and big audiences because that looks great. Well, actually, the, the really important conversations, the one which are going to have a bigger impact, are actually probably the smaller conversations that are happening. And it takes time to go and find those, but it's possible. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, there is a, there is a speed element to, to social, which is, I guess, in ways, it's good and bad. Um, it's for some people into bad habits. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's true. But I think that's the same for kind of any marketing discipline. I think we've all been in situations where we probably push stuff out too quickly and then regretted our decisions and retracted as quickly as possible. Um, and social is just another tactic that's out there for us as marketeers. Um, but I think, I think a lot of people are, are kind of looking at social as a platform where we need to do it quickly. It needs to be out now. We, we should be planning ahead. You know, we know, we know a lot of stuff that's going to happen a year ahead, you know, whether that's from a you know, an outward perspective, whether that's from an inward perspective, what our business is trying to achieve. We know a lot of that stuff. We know a lot of the stuff that's going to go on in the world in the next next 12 months. There's going to be surprises that we might need to react to. But as, as social marketers, we can absolutely plan a lot way, long way ahead. And I think people have kind of made the mistake in the past of trying to be overly reactive as opposed to um, being conscious of what their values are and actually demonstrating those through through their, their communications and their strategy. Yeah. Um, from Picking up on obviously the work that you do, and certainly it's algorithmically driven from the AI side of things. Mm. What's what's kind of the the challenge that uh, media platforms uh, are facing in terms of make helping audiences and helping brands make sense of what's going on? Yeah, so it is uh, an algorithm. So it's uh, you know a computer making those decisions and those scorings. But what's really important is that we have a human element to it. As well, so humans are very good at detecting. You know, is this article biased? Is it good, bad? Is it racist or not? Um, is it extreme, uh, far right, for example, or far left? Um, is it balanced? Um, so we we can actually spot that when we read something, um, and it's actually about teaching the machine to think the same way. 
So it actually depends on what you feed the machine in terms of evaluation data sets. So uh, we would have examples of, say, uh, sentences of hate speech that we, we feed the machine, and, and then it knows what to look for when it's analysing the text using uh, natural language understanding. Um, but the side product that I was going to talk about was um, this new platform that we're launching, which is um, uh, a news social media platform. Um, so it's basically aimed at journalists um, and anybody who's experts in, in sort of domain areas, um, maybe uh, a university uh, lecturer who's looking at stopping to uh, stopping the trend of um, or spread of um, misinformation, for example. Um, or if somebody's a journalist um, at any of the major titles who want to basically come to our platform, um, effectively they, they get this uh, browser tool which they can annotate, annotate basically sentences within articles and then post that to our platform called Briefer. Um, so instead of it being shared on likes or what your friends like, um, it's shared based on credibility of that person who's sharing it um, and trustworthiness. Um, but what we need to be also very conscious about is to make sure those people who are coming to the platform when they're annotating stuff aren't also biased. So we've also created a, a roadmap to incorporate, you know, what do we look to, to evaluate those people uh, when they're coming to the platform. And then eventually there'll be a consumer element to it. So if you're looking for uh, quality news, you can come to the platform and see um, and maybe pose questions to those journalists. Now, all that data now gets sent back to our algorithms to help it learn better. Mm. So the briefer platform won't be ad funded, but the way we fund it is the work that we do together with brands, agencies, publishers, um, trading desks, you know, uh, programmatic technology, uh, DSPs and SSPs. You said we said we're going to talk too much tech, but but what's interesting yeah. for me <laughs> is that there is a le level of it. Sounds like there's a level of reskilling, let's say, that's required to do this. I mean, I, you know, old dogs, new tricks and whatnot. When I was having this conversation the other day, I was like, I could, I could, for, yeah, I know, I know there's a purpose there, but for memes, and me and memes just don't get on. And um, it's only when I was listening to uh, a podcast the other day and someone talking about kind of like my, what, the world that I come from, which is sound bites and how memes are very much that kind of new iteration of a soundbite which people use and then kind of then propagate, right? I was, just, I was like, oh, right, now I've got the skill. I still don't have the skill. <laughs> but, you know, what kind of things do people need to take on board in order to be able to, uh, you know, if you're talking about journalists, you're talking about brands, to be able to adapt to what's going on uh, and, you know, succeed? Yeah. So I think it's just being current, like being conscious of where your brand is being exposed. Um, because, you know, appearing on sort of, uh, you know, content that is fake news causes long-term sort of brand reputation damage. So, um, so first thing is actually, you know, looking at even where you may have run your 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 ads in the last uh, three months or six months, analysing that, and then saying and working with with their agencies um, to basically stop stop that happening. Um, the other big trend is around video. You know, um, obviously. A lot of uh, content is being uploaded and consumed uh, on uh, YouTube. They're really taking this seriously to try and combat. So they've done a lot of inroads also using AI. Um, but also the brands are still quite scared about these gray areas, which they, they're not able to spot. So um, we have been uh, talking to them and also some big, big brands to see how we could work with them to actually analyze video content, where we basically can take the video uh, itself, convert uh, the speech to text, and then analyze the text for those main core things that we look for. And then uh, they can do some decisioning sort of around that side. Right. So that's a newer, newer side because, you know, especially with, you know, more content being created and produced, which is video, that's going to be an important thing going forward. Is the folks coming into the industry kind of, kind of trying to apply themselves? To, are they having, I mean, are there things that they need to kind of let go of and the, the, what was old knowledge in order to start um, uh, being able to benefit from this? Or is there a lot that we can transfer that, from what we're doing right now into, into uh, you know, using your AI, for example? Yeah, I mean, the, the 
the ways of buying media is changing quite a lot because of the way that we're consuming media. So um, with more time being spent online, consuming videos, uh, um, so you have to, the marketeers are evolving to be more, I would say, uh, more programmatic savvy, but they also need to get a lot more technical. They basically need to up their game as being marketeers and also experts within their field. So there's a lot of you know, education that needs to happen, so, and, and that education can happen from their media agencies. Mm -hmm. But also there's a trend of marketeers not trusting their agencies and they're bringing things in-house. So then they have to bring in talent Back to your question on talent, they have to find those talented people who who know already about this space, bring them in house, or speak to their agencies to get those answers. Um, but sometimes they don't answer, they always don't know what to ask them yeah. because uh, <laughs> they're, trying, they're too busy trying to figure out how to, to make it all work for them. Yeah, I think sometimes we're so st stuck in a set of KPIs that we can't really see what we're trying to achieve. Mm. I mean, is it something Grant picking up on the, on the social media side? Now, what are the what what define success in the campaign, uh, what defines impact in the campaign, do you find any kind of nuances in there which people miss uh, as a result of you know, the, the, the targets they set themselves around social media? Yeah, and I think you, you make a great point. I think marketeers in general are being pulled in 101 different directions. You know, we need to be data scientists, we have to be creatives, we have to be painters and decorators, <laughs> I don't know, all, all sorts. Yeah. Um, and that, that's pretty tough. Um, but I think, you know, when we think about social and, you know, campaigns that engage and work, I think there's, there's, there are certainly fundamentals there because I think primarily, you know, we, I kind of hate the term, but, you know, we all do need to be storytellers and we do need to tell a story on social and actually, actually engage people with something. Um, go back to what I'm saying earlier, you know, if we're just trying to sell something or push a service or, or whatever, people are going to see through that and they're not going to, they're not going to come back, they're not going to engage with that. If we can capture their imagination somehow, then, then we're, on to, uh, we're on to something good. Um, and that's difficult, but social is a great place to do that. You, you, you know, you're right, video is, video is a superb media and a, certainly a media that we're seeing a lot of brands you know, really exploring and, and trying to uncover you know, what, what actually resonates with their audience. And a lot of the time, it's just the behind the scenes stuff. You know, it doesn't need to be polished, edited. It doesn't need to be professional looking. It can be shot on your iPhone and it tells an interesting story and suddenly you've got, you've got your audience hooked. Um, but I think as brands, that's, that's kind of tough for us to get our heads around. You know, we're used to being you know, very controlling <laughs> over the look. And is that the right color? Is that the right font? Yeah. You know, is everything correct? OK, let's go through our approval process internally. And then let's go back to the beginning and perhaps do another iteration. Just make sure that's right. And then three, to your point, three months later, we'll, we'll scrap that and do another campaign because that, that's all finished. Um, and social does give us a platform to be a lot more authentic and to be a lot more genuine um, and create great connections. Um, but we do need to think about the story. We do need to think about what we're trying to tell our audience and why we're telling it. And it goes back again, you know, how do, you know, as, as digital and social marketeers, can we, can we trace that back to our values? Are we actually doing something which is, which is of relevance to that audience, um, but still has business impact? Mm. I think strikes is interesting as well as what we're seeing, I've been seeing certainly in the past 15 years is a shift from uh, folks working on staff in some of the publications that we engage with and actually come in, crossing over to the dark side, as we say, we've got a uh, former BBC journalist, Tim Weber, who, who, who's famously known as Darth Weber for coming over. Um, but there's, in, there's an incredible amount of work that, that brands are looking for. And what's, what, what's really captured my imagination is actually the challenge it is to tell these authentic stories you know, and there's then demand for kind of more quality editorial content coming from the brand itself. I think that part of that creating that shift away from you know, how you how you get audiences, how you deliver audiences to brands. Um, and I just, just picking up on that a bit more, you know, there still is quite a huge amount of trust required, I think, on behalf of content that's coming from brands themselves. You know, is it, would you just say that because you're the, it, well, you'll just say that because you're the company. I mean, how do we, how do we code for that? Yeah, so brands um, who are basically producing their own content um, will also need to be careful about what sort of content they're producing, but also if it causes their loyal customers to have uh, a backlash over creativity, if you like. So one example that we were talking about earlier was um, when, when Nationwide created a number of adverts um, at Christmas time, 
and um, they had um, actors who were more diverse, um, and they got a big backlash in their social media channels, basically a lot of hate speech. Um, so in the morning, their social media team had to come in and basically delete all these posts um, because it was causing them a lot of problems. So um, I, I think, um, it, therefore, it's, it's good to put stuff out there, but I think they um, were also very concerned about the feedback they got from um, the general public and how much you know, hate speech was out there. From uh, So I'm not saying that they... Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's a matter of A-B testing, because a lot of that can be done quite easily now, where you, know, you just put stuff out there and, and see what resonates. Um, but also being conscious, uh, you, know, you, you, shouldn't, you should basically have content that is out there that is definitely more diverse in yeah. terms of who's there, but also being mindful about the backlash that they also get and how to police that in a way. Mm. You know, Tom, I've heard uh, every company is a media company, um, but it, it, with that in mind, Graham, you know, some of the, I know I might be wrong, but I remember Spreadfast does work with uh, even some of the more traditional media outlets to help them kind of address, yep. or, I mean, what kind of, is there anything to be learned from even the traditional media companies as well? I, I mean, I think there's a there's an interesting shift between a lot of a lot of different organisations. I think you know media have been kind of the flag bearers for social media, and sports organisations have you know been kind of the flag bearers. You know, they're the guys who are being pretty sophisticated on social since since day dot. Um, they knew it was a channel to get close to their audience quickly, and they they used it, which was great. I think you know, and and you're right, we are now all media companies, and there's there's lots of you know brands who are now bringing in kind of more of an editorial uh, element to, to their content creators to be kind of more newsworthy because what they want to do is create a conversation. You know, they don't just want to put a story out there and hope people read it. They want people to actually engage in it, have a conversation with them about it. Um, but I think with media, there's, there's kind of a shift the other way now in terms of the, you know, they're having to look at social differently because we as consumers want something different. Um, I think a lot of the time we go on social because we want a bit of entertainment as well. We don't necessarily just want kind of hard-hitting news from these guys. You know, I was talking, we were talking about The Guardian earlier. I think they're a great example of uh, a brand who are, you know, very, very traditional, a media organization, very traditional, um, strong readership, you know, of, you know, moved their business model, but now looking at platforms like Instagram and going, well, how can, we, how can we be more engaging? How can we do something different? How can we change our brand voice to suit that audience, to give people content that is a little bit different, perhaps they don't quite expect from us? Um, so I think there's, there's shifts all over the place, but I think that's good. You know, if we get stuck in, as brands, if we get stuck in that rut of going, well, that works, then we're fine. We just keep doing that. Then social moves quicker than we move as brands, and, we, and consumers move quicker than we move as brands, and, we, and social gives us a good way of going, what do they want? If we're not listening to what they want, then we're never going to catch up with them. Yeah. Yeah. And do you want to pick up on that a little bit? Um, I was just thinking about, you know, uh, the traditional uh, approach of... Uh, storytelling um, and you know where the sort of adverts that you remember uh, over the years are the more entertaining engaging ones actually so people still want to see that but in, in a different way when they're when they're on social media so so yeah I would uh, I would agree that um, you know they definitely want that engagement and entertainment in terms of um, branding experience yeah was it interesting to, to, to pick up on earlier on I think I had a question earlier on about uh, the monetization side of things and how you know uh, given the challenges of being a media company and getting the eyeballs, the shift that's required, and how you maintain integrity, um, how do you maintain how do you maintain integrity when you know your your KPI is about eyeballs? Yeah, it's, I think it's hard. Um, I, I mean, the way I kind of look at we we talk slightly internally at Spreadfast a lot about brand love, which is another one of those probably room one hundred and one marketing terms that we should all ditch and never <laughs> never mention again but I actually think there's some there is some value in organizations considering what that means to their business you know what does it mean if you can actually get to the point where you know Harley Davidson someone will tattoo your logo on your arm you know I think you've achieved something pretty spectacular there and I think as brands you know how do, how do we get to that point for the majority of people you'd look at that and go we are not lovable as a brand you know you, you, we hear that a lot we're all lovable there's absolutely, there is love everywhere. Um, but I think when I, you know, the way I kind of look at this is that, you know, we as marketers, we look at a lot of the time at kind of big campaigns, big kind of temple events and stuff. And, and actually to, to keep that 
authenticity and to keep that integrity, we need to keep delighting our audience. And it needs to be fast and it needs to be quick. Um, and that's a big shift. And I think we can't just rely on you know, one big hit every so often, whether that's a big sale or a big launch or whatever it may be. Look at what we're doing. Isn't that the next amazing thing? Well, actually, they've, they've moved on. Mm -hmm. They want to hear from you constantly. And that is, again, going back to this point of having a conversation. Whether you're just providing good care, whether you are providing them with something useful, something they didn't know. Did you hear about this? Did you know we were doing this? There's lots of stuff. And you don't need to be bombarding them. But again, that's understanding what they want and joining in with that conversation as well. So I think there's a... I don't want to, I'm, not, I'm not saying we need, we need volume, but there's, there's definitely quality and you know, consideration of what, what our audience expects from us and, and needs. Uh, yeah, I think the, when I look at the kind of uh, what's going on with that conversation in social you know, that our, our clients are engaged in, yes, yeah, certainly on one side, it's the, you know, we, how, much, how much do we get, how much pull through do we get? which is always going to be hitting you, but the actual engagement level shifts quite a bit. One of the areas that I look at quite closely is the B2B side of things. So, you know, there's always this kind of idea that you know, we are business decision makers and have, and therefore think in a different way. And certainly our, the, the way it's going right now is we're, we're very much shifting that piece and treating business decision makers as consumers and trying to, or as people, should I say, and trying to engage them emotionally as, as much as we do kind of that rational because we make rational decisions. Um, is there any, in anything that you kind of, in your experiences, the brands that you're working with that is nuanced around B2B and B2C engagement? Uh, I mean, I, I, I slightly hate the term B2B. Yeah. <laughs> For yeah. reasons I'm sure we all understand. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, there's an individual at the end of that conversation, whether that's, you know, over a phone, sat around here on, on, on social media, you know, and we need to be mindful of that, that conversation. So I think B2B is catching up on social mm -hmm. in terms of how they can use it as, a, as, as platforms or as a platform. Um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. Um, but again, it's, you know, think about what you're, what you're trying to do with social. You know, what is your strategy for it? If you're just trying to sell stuff, then it's just not, it's not going to work. Um, you know, even retailers and people who are, you know, doing good stuff on social, they're, they're going to struggle if they're just trying just to sell stuff. Um, I think B2B's got a great place because of the educational value it can provide. You know, typically, and I've, I've always worked B2B side, and, you know, when we stop and think about what we're trying to do as a business and the knowledge that typically is internal, how do we get that out? Um, how do we actually start articulating and educating audiences through, through social as a platform in the same way that, you know, B2B are quite happy to stand up an event and... Uh, and, and kind of preach to the audience about you know how great their service or product is, but they're not quite willing to do it on social, which doesn't to me doesn't make sense. Yes, so I think it's a yeah. it's a mind shift, but yeah. um, there's there's a ton of opportunity there. Again, know your audience. What do they want? Yeah. Ask them. Yeah, yeah, that's well, an interesting that. thing to do. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking about that, there was at this uh, event last week um, around programmatic advertising, um, and there was a B two B advertiser called National Lighting. Some, Basically, they sell light bulbs <laughs> um, to people like Screwfix and um, all these companies. But they created this online shop. And um, they said a lot of their, their trade people who would normally you know, um, order stuff uh, via a trade counter would always check the weather before they go out and, and they get something. So um, in an email campaign, they used to send these email updates. And they put a little weather, what, what's, what's the weather in your location? And that's sort of a massive opening of this email newsletter, just because they added that little bit, bit of functionality to, to help the, the trace people. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think you know, there's uh, the interesting thing about social data when you kind of get into you know kind of nuances like that. But you can you know, there's a lot of geo targeting that you can do yeah, with social. Totally. So you can go down to minute audiences. You know, there was the story about was it with the spoons that closed all their social accounts recently for all their different brands because you know they're they're not going to get a. You know, the, the audience isn't necessarily going to engage, which I think is probably probably fair. But who is your audience? You know, if your audience is actually that that community or that village, then social they're still on social, they're still there. But are you creating content that is interesting to that audience? Probably not. Right. I'm not saying they didn't do the right thing, but <laughs> <laughs> with, with the audience in mind, as I say, we've got we've got some time, and I'd rather than kind of just save everything to the end. I was wondering if there's any questions at this stage, any comments at this stage. Um, just, just a sort of philosophical question for the panel. Where do each of you stand on the question of 
who's responsible for policing fake news? Is it the responsibility of the individual writing something, or is it the responsibility of the platform on which it's published? So, you know, at one extreme, you might have hate speech that's inciting jihadism, which most people would say is wrong, but equally there's value to free speech and you could argue actually let's have that view out there and then let's have someone respond to it and if you close it down it's censorship um but equally um you know you don't want to um to you know what the consequences of that could be it could be catastrophic and there's a billion people on facebook or whatever the numbers are so you know is it income we don't tell paper companies that they have to police what people write on paper. So should Facebook be clamping down or not? Or, you know, it is a responsibility on the person. Where do kind of each of you stand on that philosophical question? Uh, personally, I think it's a, it's a bit of both. I think, that, I, think, uh, I think it's always easy to blame the technology. It's easy to go the technology's flawed, but we as individuals have an have a absolute role to play here. You know, we're, we're the content creators, we're the content consumers. Technology is just the enabler for us to read that and, and engage with it if we choose to. So I think primarily it's down, it's down to us. Um, the platforms are there to, to kind of help and guide, but I think ultimately it's down to us as individuals in terms of the content we create and how we consume and, and what we share and how we, how we interact with that content. Yeah, so I think those social media platforms would regard themselves as platforms versus media owners and publishers. Um, so that's a, a first thing to note, that they will separate themselves quite, quite quickly against what is being spread. Um, a lot of them have taken a bashing over the last couple of years um, but, and are addressing that by basically improving their AI techniques, having um, communities of people um, who are detecting things, labeling things, which is also quite, can be quite boring for this you know, farm of people who are doing that, so stuff does get missed. Um, but it also just comes down to um, the amount that's uh, being created is basically because it has been ad-funded and people are making money off it. So the, the, the quality has become less. Um, so I would say it's also down to uh, the publishers who are originally creating this content. Um, so, you know, especially when they're looking at uh, quality news journalism that's um, opinionated and uh, has, you know, proper investigations done versus um, content that could be reseeded from elsewhere um, and created just to get, you know, um, ad revenue potentially. So um, it does, I think it does come down to whoever's creating that content. Um, in terms of policing it, um, there should be definitely the ability to have uh, freedom of speech, um, but if it becomes hurtful, if somebody actually gets hurt physically or you know, uh, a community does, then lines do have to be drawn. Um, things like violence, for example, is very, very much unacceptable. Um, also for the brands appearing against that sort of stuff. Um, so the brands actually have to take a stand, I would say, to s stop funding um, that sort of content. And a lot of the time, they don't know um, that they've appeared in, on that until the CMO gets a screen grab and so suddenly it's in a, a national newspaper highlighting the issue. I think the other, the other thing I would add is when we think about social, it's something like 14, 15 years old. You know, social is still a teenager. You know, and if you, if you think about social as a, you know, a, a marketing technique compared to other stuff that we have, you know, take email marketing, I've been doing digital marketing for 20 years. Email marketing's been there for as long as I have, and it's only this Friday that we've suddenly got GDPR to suddenly start controlling the mass emails that we're able to say, before we could just do what we liked. It was great. <laughs> now this Friday, they're like, no, actually, 20, 20, I don't even know how long email marketing's been around. Yeah, no, I'm looking at you guys like you know. Yeah. <laughs> Probably that time, yeah. Yeah, I think social's not even that old. Yeah, I think- Things um, doing all right. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, and I think, Picking up on, the, on that point in particular, I think uh, philosophically, uh, I do feel that the onus is on the audience. I think the challenge is that the audience hasn't been given the training necessary to, to do that, to address it. So coming back to the early analogy around the Gutenberg Press and you know how uh, 
100 years of fake news that followed that was then addressed through journalism, through libraries, through other methods of organizing that information, giving it credibility. You know, I think we're in that phase again, but there's, the information is so vast that there simply isn't enough libraries, journalists, others to, to discern that information. So actually, the, the onus is on the audience. Um, you know, there are obviously reputationally as a PR person thinking about some of the implications that can happen if your brand is associated with a piece of content that was ne wasn't intended or was accidentally uh, put there. You've got to be mindful of that and then police it. Um, but yeah, take it, taking a step back, and I always use my think of my son as an example of this. He's in school and he's been taught to use a computer. He's been taught to use a mouse and a keyboard. And I'm like, why am I? T this is. This is not the kind of lesson that he needs. He needs to be able to, he knows, he, he comes on, he goes on YouTube and other platforms, and he knows exactly what, how to use them. He doesn't know what it, he, what it is he should be looking for, he doesn't know what it is, you know, the content, how to discern one from the other. And what I worry about is that there's a generation there that's not getting any of that. And so it's gonna be, you know, con continue on for some while we, while we continue to learn. So, yeah, philosophically, I think it's on the side of the audience, and if we shift in that direction, then regulation, education, all the other things that we want to see will start putting us in, into a, a better place, and then the policing, the other side, will come uh, even more naturally to us as brands. Thank you. Um, I absolutely agree that audience um, is key and education is key. But how do we deal with issues like confirmation bias, tribal epistemology? You know, these are rising trends and we have sort of a lot of nefarious actors now building on this and influencing and uh, getting into legitimate, legitimate or traditionally legitimate sources. Yeah. So how do you think we could use AI specifically to try and address those issues? Um, so yeah, so in terms of uh, bias, for sure, um, it all depends on who's been marking it. In terms of like, so us as a company, there's you know 15 of us, and we've been looking at, and we're quite a diverse team, different backgrounds. Um, but we we would be annotating some articles ourselves, but then when we open up the platform, we would make sure that the the people coming onto the platform aren't also biased in their own views. So we have got some patents that we've released around that, that part. Um, so it all depends on what you feed uh, the machine learning. So if you're feeding it biased information, then it will just look for that. So it has to be uh, very balanced. Um, so we, we could say, yep, yeah, this, this article is extreme right, uh, extreme left, um, but we know for sure it's not balanced, right? So um, that's kind of uh, where we'll sort of do those decisioning, if you like. Um, and then we could also help publishers with that information, like what sort of content are they putting out. Most of them will probably know, depending on which publication it is, uh, but some of them also want to, you know, see what to do with that content. You know, how should they, uh, how could they make a piece of content more, um, more balanced? I would also specifically with the audience as well, because obviously they um, yeah, specifically with the audience as well, because I, like I say, we, we're needing to yeah. educate people and like yeah. the, the stats earlier saying how so many people can't recognise yeah. and also people don't want to see it now, you know, particularly in our polarised world. Yeah, totally. The rise yeah. of extremism and yeah. um, partisanship growing. And a lot of, you know, with, um, with di you know, digital platforms now, there are so many sources now and yeah. much more partisan websites that people gravitate towards. And so also, how can we use it to, to educate the public, like you're saying, you know, we need to, to so, get to them, not just act as a, a filter. Yeah, so um, if you can imagine all these experts and um, journalists who've been basically annotating not just their own work, which they probably wouldn't do, they'll probably be annotating other people's work, posting it to the platform, and then actually we want to encourage consumers to come to the platform and then pose questions to those experts. Let's say there's an expert on climate change or a topic on climate change. Can they ask the, the journalists some questions and actually start a topic thread around that discussion? And we're hoping that discussion will help educate them at the same time. Can you pick up on that all? No, what he said. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Take another question. Sorry, forgive me, what's your name again? Anant. Anant. Yeah. 
um, regards to AI, most people that work in tech tend to be white males. And um, it's interesting you say your team's really diverse. And so yeah. one of the things that came up previously with um, facial recognition was the yeah. challenge that you had that most people programming AI, programming based on their biases. So in terms of your team, it's quite diverse, but what about the rest of the industry picking up some of the biases that come through based on just being a person programming based on what you see as opposed to what the rest of the nation may see, which is quite diverse. If you notice in London, there's been a high population growth from people that are non-white background. So how does that factor in your work and across the industry? Yeah, so um, that is uh, really super important. Like, um, I didn't go into the too, um, uh, too much detail about um, how fat matter is made up, but most, most of the uh, team in the machine learning team are actually women um, who are which is great for us as a company um, so um, but again back to the point of um, I guess looking at those uh, those experts we're hoping to find more diverse experts as well who are coming to our platform um, it does depend on sort of maybe even NGOs that we might be working with um, so um, who are who have their own communities of experts, and um, so you know, can we partner with, you know, stop funding hate or um, let's uh, people like Sleeping Giants in the US? But then we also hear from brands, and they also don't like that approach um, with being sort of forced um, for that decision or being put on the spot by some some of those uh, NGOs. Um, so I think it's uh, it depends on that, but we also make. What we plan to do is actually make our um, evaluation data set made public. So um, if there's any communities that we can help to send this information to, and they, and they can actually see the scores. So we can say, hey, this, this URL that we've marked, um, we think it's um, extremely sexist because um, this particular sentence is what we picked up. What do you think? And then having feedback based on that, and you know, can they use that for good? So. Um, we are considering that. Uh, we'll have to see how it pans out over the, the next few few months. And Grant, Grant picking up and um, picking up on a story around Brexit. I will because it was it was there. I was, I was, I was with one of um, Graham's colleagues uh, when it happened. The day after it happened, and we were in Victoria in Westminster. Uh, the whole area just seemed to be in this kind of strange place where we were like we couldn't believe what has happened. And it's that whole kind of Westminster, um, London kind of bubble that just missed everything that went on. And I think picking up on what you're saying there, was there a, if there was an algorithm, was an AI that actually did that, that attempt to understand what was going on everywhere outside of here, we might have actually been closer to some level of truth, right? Um, uh, just, yeah, just from your perspective in terms of how you're encouraging companies to, to think beyond you know, that immediate bubble, let's say, um, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, it's, it, it, that's actually a really, it's a really interesting challenge. And I think, it, again, I keep going back to the opportunity that brands have here. You know, one of the, the big challenges that we, we see, and I talk to a lot of organizations that are perhaps headquartered in France and in Germany, and when it comes to social, what we're trying to do is be relevant to, to audiences. And, you know, for a lot of bigger brands, their challenge is how do you take this kind of corporate message and do you make it relevant to local audiences? You know, it's very easy for us sat in London to go, here's, here's what we want to say. And then in France, they're like, no, nope, not interested. In Germany, they're like, no, nope, not interested. And back to my point earlier, you know, we, you know, we do kind of encourage people to think about the entertainment value of social. That's really hard when you're trying to do it across different countries and across different borders. Um, you know, what we think funny here does not necessarily resonate in other regions. Um, so I think, you know, that's where, you know, your, your team can, to the point you've just raised, actually, the more diverse your, your team is that's building these social strategies, the more opinions you can get to, uh, to uh, you know, help create that content and be resonant on, resonant on local levels is, is hugely important. And it's a, it's a big challenge and a big opportunity for brands to be really present on social. Things that you mentioned the, the, the bias side of things was I, I give um, bo uh, con unconscious bias training at our office, and it's one of those things I give it every month, and I forget how, how often I introduce bias every day, the, the minute after I've given that training, and I just wonder if there's a piece of actually this is a constant thing that we need to keep training ourselves around in terms of how you in, how you introduce or how you do some uh, to use the term crap detection when you're going out there and knowing what's 
knowing what's bad, what's good, and introducing uh, alternative voices into your news feed or into your social media. Um, any other questions? Hi, yeah, it's over oh. here. Um, I just want a different kind of question, actually, but I'm yeah. just wondering, we've talked a lot about, you know, bias and stuff, but um, in terms of opportunities for business, I mean, do you see any kind of opportunities for business out of this distrust that consumers have at the moment? You know, maybe pull out some kind of positives and how businesses might look at this and see um, a way forward with it, really. Uh, I can pick up on that first of all. Just that, as I say, it's a huge data set. Didn't get a chance to talk through all of it. Um, one consistent theme that comes through in the trust barometer pretty much year after year is people's belief that uh, businesses can lead the way, that leaders and chief execs can certainly lead the way, and that actually if you take a position on, you know, you mentioned earlier values, but certainly on purpose, uh, that it's possible to achieve profits, you know, while being uh, cognizant of some of the, you know, the, the, the trust element as well. So it's, it's possible, people feel it's possible, uh, then it's up to businesses and leaders to act. Um, so very much positive in that light. And then what we start to see, and I was speaking to uh, one of the uh, members here earlier on about the, you know, the, the direction of purpose. Um, it's an interesting, interesting space in, 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 in my area where we've had this kind of uh, focus on so, uh, corporate social responsibility and we're advising and guiding clients on it. Increasingly, we're being tasked with purpose, and I always thought we had that to a certain degree, but we, we clearly don't, and we're seeing purpose agencies, we're seeing purpose consultants come into the 4 uh, because perhaps from a, from a uh, brand perspective, company perspective, it's not been something that's been at the, the forefront of uh, you know, uh, what's been driving strategy, uh, but it certainly seems to be heading in that direction. Uh, you know, coming out of um, uh, the Davos, where uh, Richard Edelman goes along and shares his uh, data, uh, we had the Salesforce uh, chief exec saying the problem that the tech industry has is, uh, is trust, and we need to do more to address this. So there's, I think there's certainly a shift, shift in this direction uh, and, an, and a recognition from, you know, right from the top that this can be addressed. I think it's just more of a case of listening and seeing how you can respond to it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anna? I would just say that, yeah, um, we definitely want to see a lot of the junk content being removed <laughs> uh, and people spending less on sort of uh, appearing against that. So um, I think brands, uh, you know, biz big businesses, big brands that we're talking to need to sort of stand up, be very vocal. Uh, Mark Pritchard from P&G has been very vocal about things like uh, transparency and uh, especially on online media, um, same as Keith Weed from, from Unilever. Um, so they are taking a stand against the industry, like um, uh, wanting to bring trust back also with the agencies that they're working with, price transparency. Um, but a, a lot of it comes down to media quality. Um, uh, so where we see things going is that uh, apart from those three sort of core um, um, algorithms that we're detecting for, what other things can we start to look that will help us look at uh, scoring things based on credibility and trustworthiness? Um, so that can be, you know, is, is a topic going to be very controversial or um, is there something, um, uh, other topics that, you know, brands don't want to appear against or what do they see as quality metrics? So. Um, those things, from a, an AI point of view, will help them decide uh, where they should be investing their money as well, long term. I, no, I, would, I mean, I would echo both, both your, your comments. Um, I think I would challenge everyone to think about what does trust mean to your customer? You know, what, what's actually going to make them trust you? Um, I go back to Patagonia again, you know, their first, their first brand value. We want to deliver good products. Where you can we can buy a bag off them or a coat or a pair of shoes or whatever it may be any any day of the week. What's going to make us keep going back? Their purpose. You know, that's yeah. what's going to keep us with them long term. You know, short term is the sale. Long term is is your belief in them as a business and your trust in them as a business. So how do you work that out? What does that mean for your customer? Yeah. 